Okay, welcome everyone. We're just giving um, a little bit of time for people to sign in. So we'll probably get started in a couple of minutes. So welcome everyone. Um, so just um, while we're waiting for everyone to come in, I might just do some very quick uh, housekeeping announcements. So first of all, if you do have any questions or comments during the session, please write them in the Q&A box um, and then our moderators are able to pass them on to Dylan and myself. Um, also, just to let everyone know, this will be our last journal club for the year. Um, so I'll be giving myself a little bit of a rest for a few months before we plan our event series for next year. So we already have some ideas for next year, but if anyone has any ideas for engaging speakers on gambling related topics that they've seen recently that they might think would be appropriate for helping us out with Journal Club, um, please get in contact with me and let me know. And just to let everyone know, next year we will be moving back to a mix of face-to-face -face and webinar Journal Clubs. I know the webinars have been great in that we can reach people who it's a little bit difficult for them to come face to face, but I know others do prefer the uh, the face to face events where they get to um, to sit with and talk with their colleagues. So we are going to move back to a mix um, of face to face and online next year to, to give us that bit of a balance. Um, and I'd also like to announce that um, Professor Sally Gainsbury, who, as most of you know, is the director of the Gamble Aware Central Sydney Clinic at Sydney Uni. Um, she wanted me to announce that um, a technology risk and gambling webinar series will be recommencing on December 1st. So registration details will soon be available and I will circulate those on the Journal Club mailing list. And alongside that, I will be circulating a recording of today's webinar uh, alongside recordings of all of our previous webinars, which are all available on our YouTube playlist. All right, so on that note, it's time to get started. So today's webinar is about uh, wagering. So, you know, the title that I gave it today was How to Win on Horses and Sports. Um, you know, it was a bit of a, a cheeky title. Um, so I just wanna make sure that I'm letting everyone know that I'm not advocating for people to quit their jobs here and take up uh, betting on sports. Um, but what this is really about is essentially showing that there is a difference between what most gamblers are doing and what professional gamblers are doing. So professional gamblers do exist and there are some, a very, very small number, of course, of them, um, but some of them can make um, quite large sums of money. So for those of you that have been working in the sector for a while, um, we had NAGS, uh, the National Association of Gambling Studies Conference um, down in Hobart in 2019. Um, and just to illustrate how successful some professional gamblers are, we had the opening reception in the Mona Art Museum, which was paid for by professional gambling winnings. So um, there are some people who do make a lot of money from this, but as a, they're a very small number. And what we're going to learn today is what essentially goes into becoming a professional gambler, the amount of data and the amount of skill that it requires, and why that's so out of reach to the average punter, who are the, the people that we're seeing in our clinic. Um, so today, most of today is going to be a, a pre-recorded interview that I did with uh, Joseph Buckdahl, who is a uh, betting market analyst. Um, and the reason we did a pre-record is because he's based over in the UK and the time difference didn't quite work. Um, but with me today, I also have my colleague, uh, Dr. Dylan Pickering. So for those of you that don't know, he's a postdoctoral research associate, associate here at the University of Sydney's Gambling Treatment and Research Clinic. Um, so his PhD, which was completed 
three years ago, four years ago. 29, end of 2019, yes. Um, and um, oh, I was going to explain what your PhD was on, but I'll let you give it. Uh, yeah, so my, my PhD, I looked at uh, recovery in gambling disorder, um, how, how we can conceptualise recovery and also how we can measure recovery as well, just um, in terms of measuring progress with people that are experiencing gambling problems as well as um, evaluating programs um, for harm minimization for gambling problems as well. Okay, so yeah, so how it's going to work is um, Dylan and I are going to give a brief introduction, then we're going to play the video, and then after that, we've got plenty of time for um, for Dylan and I will probably start with a bit of a discussion of the interview, and then we'll take questions um, and comments from from you attendees. So um, yeah, Dylan, do you want to get started on some of our? We wanted to start with some definitional terms because some of the terms that are used in the interview might be um, uh, new to some people. So we wanted to start with that. Yeah, absolutely. I found when I was um, listening back to the, the interview between Chris and, and Joseph, I was madly in the background trying to Google different terms. So we thought we'd save you um, the hassle of doing that and kind of define them now for you. So some of the things that came up, the first was um, reference to different types of um, bookmaker markets. Um, so the first is a, a totalizator or the tote. Uh, this is how the TAB or the TAB works in Australia. And essentially what happens is all the money um, that's bet on a market goes into a pool um, that the, the bookmaker then takes a cut from that pool, say 10%, and then the pool is then divvied up between the winners of a particular event. So the person um, that makes a bet, they will be shown odds when they place their bet, but the price that they actually get will change as more money comes into the market uh, all the way up to the closure of that particular um, event or the closing line is what they call it. Uh, fixed odds, on the other hand, this is how most bookmakers operate in Australia or as overseas as well. Uh, the key difference between fixed odds and the tote is that fixed odds um, is the odds that the person, or the pro sorry, the um, it's the, the odds at the time of, of the bet that is placed is what they'll actually get paid out at if, if they are to win on a particular event. So the price will still change, it will go up and down after the um, better makes the bet. Um, but again, they'll still get that same price that they place their bet on. Uh, another key term is what I referred to as before is the closing line. Uh, so this refers to the odds at the time that the actual event starts um, and when the betting market closes. So the closing line is actually a good uh, heuristic or indicator for the value of the bet. So it gives bettors a, a general indication of, of how good their that how good their bet is or their closing line value. So if a person that has uh, bets on a particular event and their odds are higher, say five dollars on a horse, um, and then the closing line is say two dollars on the horse, then that's an indicator that they had a good value bet. Um, the reverse is also true. So if a person was to place two dollars, like a bet on a two dollar horse and it went out to $5 at the closing line, that would be an indicator of, um, a, of a poor bet or a bad value bet. So Chris, did you want to take these ones away? Yeah, so one of the other things that we talk about in the, in the interview is the difference between a deterministic and a probabilistic worldview. So um, it does get, a, this is a bit, um, for those of you that have studied physics in the past, they might be uh, mathematics and statistics in the past, they might be more familiar with this. So it is a little bit, um, I guess, metaphysical to an extent. But basically, um, what we talk about with a deterministic worldview, it's basically the idea that events can be predicted through understanding cause and effect. And it, the idea that if you know what happens before, you can predict what's going to happen next. So, um, so a real world example would be, if I flip a light switch, the light turns on, like it's a one-to-one -one relationship between cause and effect. Um, and that's contrasted with... Um, a probabilistic worldview, which is this idea that events can't be predicted with certainty. We can only describe what's likely to occur. So the example would be if, if A happens, then B becomes more or less likely. So the focus is on estimating the probability of different outcomes. So the real world example would be when we look at the weather report, um, it predicts the chance of rain. It doesn't say, yes, it'll rain, no, it won't. It'll say today there's a 70% chance of rain or a 30% chance of rain. We don't get a definitive answer. We just get um, a probability estimate that will vary based on different things. So if you know the Bureau of Meteorology goes and measures the um, humidity and it's higher than they think, then they increase the chance that it's going to rain. 
Um, so they also, in this interview, we, they also talk about the distinction between different types of betting. Um, so when we talk about, you know, winning focused betting, essentially that's betting that's based on that deterministic uh, view of the world. And it's essentially what the greater majority of punters are doing, including by far the greater majority of the clients that we were likely to see in a gambling clinic. Um, and it's basically, you're making a bet based on who you think is most likely to win. So what horse you think is most likely to win, what team's most likely to win. And it's most the most common form of betting and it's what most people do. And it seems to make a lot of intuitive sense. But that contrasts to what, um, as we'll hear professional gamblers do, which is what called is what's called value, value betting, which is where the focus is on probability estimates of various outcomes and how that compares to the price offered at a particular time. So what this assumes is when professional gamblers are betting that they don't assume that they're going to win on any individual bet, but they try and focus on the long-term outcomes. And um, it requires a lot of statistical expertise, as we're going to hear in the interview ahead. So it is a lot more difficult, and that is the reason why there are so very few professional gamblers. But we'll talk about that a little bit more after the interview. Um, other thing in the interview, just to point out that he, um, my interviewee is from the UK. So when he talks about football, he is talking about soccer. Um, so anyway, that's the end of our slides today. So I'm going to start the interview now. And as I said, any comments, questions, please put them in the Q&A box and Dylan and I will do our best to answer them after the event, uh, after the interview. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, a special and hopefully interesting uh, gambling journal club presented by Gamble Aware Central Sydney and the University of Sydney. And today I'm going to be joined by Joseph Bookdahl, um, who is a betting market analyst working over in the UK. So I'd like to start by, first of all, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I'm standing on. Um, so that's the Eora people of the Gadigal Nation. Um, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, but I'd like to start now by introducing Joseph. So Joseph um, Bookdahl is a science graduate from Trinity College at Cambridge University, who started as an environmental scientist and then um, became a sports betting analyst uh, around 1991. I'll let him tell a little bit of his own story later on. Um, but since 2001, he has um, been curating footballdata.co.uk, which provides historical results and odds data to um, help others um, achieve profitable advantage when it comes to betting. Um, he's written books on sports betting, tipping, gambling and investment, uh, which all tell a story about how his views on these subjects have evolved over time. So I'd like to start by welcoming uh, Joseph to our journal club. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thanks for inviting me. No problem. So um, I might just start by asking you, yeah, how did you get into into betting markets? Well, I, I guess my probably the, the, to describe me as an analyst, it probably didn't really come till later on, maybe 10 years after I met this chap at Trinity College called Patrick Veitch or Beach. And he was a mathematician um, two years ahead of me. A real prodigy at mathematics but he wasn't doing a lot of work and much to his consternation of his tutors and he was investing all his time in learning how to or beating the, the horse racing markets and making a lot of money at it and i was kind of fascinated what he was doing so a few times i would i would go and place bets for him and collect winnings for him because obviously the pre-internet days you could only bet in, in, the, in the shops mm -hmm. and he was known amongst all the bookmakers and, couldn't show his face so he had to get people to do this for him and I got really intrigued so I always had a love of numbers and I always had a love of sports and when I met a chap like him it was like this is just absolutely fascinating mm -hmm. that, that someone could be doing this and actually making a living from this sadly failing his degree in the process but I can't I can't it doesn't really matter for him because 30 years on he's I mean he's a multimillionaire. I mean that's not necessarily the, the thing that you one should aspire to but in in terms of setting out and and achieving a, a life goal he's very much done that he, i think he very much was a, a character that wanted to, to beat the system uh, during during his exploit he he ended up in um a rather sticky situation being blackmailed and had to actually go into hiding for a few years and mm -hmm. from that process his one of his missions was to, to kind of seek revenge and he thought who can i seek revenge on it can't be the person that 
was blackmailing me, who ended up in prison for a, for a different offence anyway. Um, so he took his revenge out on the bookmakers. So he, for him, I think it was very much a personal journey of seeing how he could win through beating the system. And I guess I was very much intrigued by that, that kind of thinking. And in the end, I wouldn't say followed in his footsteps, but I, I took a different path through football and then ultimately through providing the data and um, monitoring, monitoring and, and verifying tips of other people. So I, I, I took a different route, but it was it was very much one that I, I was intrigued by through him. Okay, very interesting. And uh, yeah, it definitely sounds like, um, well, he's definitely led a colourful life by how you're describing it. But um, yeah, so yeah, so at the moment, um, you know, your what are you? What does a betting market analyst do? Like, what is, what is your day to day job? What does it entail? Um, really, I am. Um, uh, initially, I was someone who was who started out as providing data. So mm -hmm. I suppose it was, I, and I'm always upfront when I say when people say they criticise me, saying you, you're not really a professional better, are you? And I say no, I'm not a professional better because I was never I was never good enough to, to at betting to make a living from it. So I kind of played around with it, make, making some money, breaking even over a few years, and then decided, can I actually sell the data to make some kind of business out of this? So it all started through to really just posting a, a question on a betting forum to how much money would people be prepared to pay for the data that I have. Mm -hmm. And from those answers, I set up footballdata.co.uk in 2001. And so it really much started out as a data provision service. And from that, you kind of immersed in the whole day-to-day -day business of collecting data, betting on it yourself now and again, and and then gradually going through the I went through the process of just gradually studying all the different betting systems, betting approaches, betting markets, staking plans, money management, risk analysis, and so my my journey through this whole thing has evolved into what would now become more described as a, as a betting analyst. So I would I would study different markets and how they operate, and then the, and a lot of my writing is is really about the, the risk management and, and staking and and that sort of thing so it's it's kind of I'm, I'm I suppose I'm a capsule really um, yeah yeah okay interesting and it's definitely you know one of the, the things I guess that you're sort of coming back to there is that you know the key part of your role is essentially as a conduit for the data so collecting data and disseminating it mm. so yeah. you know I guess and this is I guess something that I think would be intriguing to those of us working as gambling counselors and psychologists in the field is is just the scale of the data that we're talking about. So, you know, most of the clients we see that have, you know, betting problems and gambling problems, they're, you know, relying on small numbers of data points before making a decision about, you know, who to bet on. Mm. You know, we're talking about, you know, four or five bits of data that you could get from the newspaper. What sort of amount of data would someone like you collect um, or someone who is a professional gambler require to make an informed decision about whether or not to make a bet? Like what, how many data well, points for the average um, football match? I mean, potentially they could be spending a lot of money on that. And you, you'd have, you'd potentially have historical data, just, just for a football market, for example, you'd have obviously the results, you might have data on match statistics. So you've got all of the things that take place in the game, corners, shots, fouls, referee cards, those sorts of things. If you've got access to even better quality data, you, you'll have player data, um, and some of this can cost thousands of pounds potentially. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're really only the, the biggest pros um, out there will, will be purchasing that sort of data. But then on, on the other side, you could be potentially purchasing odd streams and and live market updates for the different odds and so on. So there's there's potentially so much that you could get your hands on, but it's going to cost you a lot of money. So it's really only the pros that are doing this. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's not. It, it, it's a very different world between the yeah. pro better and just an, an amateur better who is just really just looking to I mean the main difference really between an amateur and a professional is that an amateur who's just betting for recreation is really only interested in in whether they can whether their bet's going to win so in other mm -hmm. words the outcome whereas every professional the journey they will go on will they will learn and they will arrive at the place where what matters is the actual process of analysis rather than the outcomes and it's it's not what will happen but it's what you expect to happen so it's all very much about expectation 
mm. rather than the actual outcomes. And that's really the difference. And I think it, it's difficult. It, it would be difficult to say that no professional better could ever be classified as a, as a, as a gambling addict. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question that um, I suppose in one respect, it, it, it's not necessarily going to be harmful to them because they're not going to be financial out of their pocket if they're, if they're professional and they're making a living from, mm -hmm. from gambling. Um, but I suppose in one sense where it, it, it wouldn't necessarily, it, it's less likely to become damaging, pathological, is because it, the focus is on expectation rather than outcomes. And in that sense, it very much strips out a lot of the emotions. Another thing that professional veterans are very good at is just stripping out the emotions from what mm -hmm. they're doing, just focusing on the process. So, no, it's very it's fascinating what you're saying there. It's really because I think that's it. It's, you know, the clients that we see uh, coming into our clinics and other clinics, they're very much focused on, as I said before, using these small amount of data points to try and predict the winner. Um, and sometimes it's, it's not even combining those data points in any sort of um, algorithmic or formulaic way. It's just sort of based on a gut feeling as like, well, mm -hmm. you know, I just, you know, I feel like, you know, this team wants it more or this, you know, these sorts of um, yeah, tropes yeah. that we hear. Um, but it's interesting, yeah, you're talking about expectations. So um, I guess just to, I guess, put another spin on that is what you're sort of saying, what they're looking at is, you know, trying to get estimates of, you know, the probabilities of different outcomes. Is that, mm. what, is that the sort of flavor of what they're going for? Or is that- it, It's absolutely, I mean, the, the difference is that an amateur would, it would be, they're only interested in how many winners they can get and whether they're going to win. Whereas the professional is interested in whether they've got what's called expected value. Mm -hmm. So, for example, just in, with a coin toss analogy, if you would expect the, the coin to, to, to land 50 times out of 100 heads and tails, it won't mm -hmm. always, sometimes it'll be 40, 45, sometimes mm -hmm. it'll be 55. But the expectation is it's 50. Now, if the silly bookmaker was going to be paying you one dollar ten cents for every time it landed heads for and you had to pay the the, the one dollar to take part mm -hmm. that would be what's called expected value so yep. you would expect you expect to win 50 times one dollar ten and you expect mm -hmm. to lose 50 times one dollar so overall over the hundred coin tosses you would expect to be up whatever it would be ten uh, uh, be one dollar or, or ten dollars or whatever it would be you know, ten ten percent um you won't always get that. Yeah. It's all about the expectation. And the professional will only focus on expected value. And so they're not interested in whether the bet will win or lose. They're not interested in the, the outcomes. And they're very much, they're, what they're very good at is when they lose a bet, they, they'll just move on to the next one. And they won't even think about the emotion. The emotion to them is it's irrelevant. But so you, they can lose a bet and still think it was a good bet because they still held the expected value. Whereas they might lose, and I've lost bets. I've lost bets that I still think were great, and I've actually won bets, which in retrospect I've looked at and thought, actually, no, that was a bad bet. It was a, I didn't do the proper research. I got lucky and I won. So it's very much about expectation and not about the winning and about luck. And I think that the problem with, the problem with a lot of amateurs and certainly pathological gamblers is, is that they, they massively overestimate the skill that which they think they can bring to the whole exercise and they mm -hmm. massively underestimate the amount of luck and what's called variance in statistical violence um in gambling and on a, on a bet by bet basis it's almost all varying there's, there's, there's almost no skill the skill only starts to reveal itself after tens and hundreds and even possibly even thousands and tens of thousands of, of wages of course the danger is is that you you have to kind of know that you've got that expected value on, mm -hmm. on the outside or you have to ha at least have a method of being able to, to, to tell yourself you don't have it very quickly because it can take a long time for results to reveal that you don't have that skill and that you've only ever had luck and luck's always going to run out in you and so that i guess is, is the danger and the danger for an amateur that then that, lets um, betting become dangerous to them is that it can take a long time for them to learn that and by the time yeah. they may have even learned that it's beyond the point where they're in control of what they're doing. 
Yeah, and I think you, you've raised a couple of points there that I want to follow up on. And I think the first one is definitely what you're speaking of there is one of the, the issues that we, we deal with quite a lot in counselling with people who, um, who have gambling problems, which is this idea that they, they very much rely on that um, small picture focus. They're using a small amount of results to make um, to, to guide their decision making going forward. This, this idea, well, you know, I won last week, therefore it's possible for me to win today, therefore I should keep going and so forth. And losing track of the big picture, which is, you know, if you take that step back and you see that that sea of red um, that's sort of, you know, behind the numbers when you look at it. But the other thing I think that's interesting that you raise there is this idea that, you know, to identify um, these sort of value, it, it requires skill that requires a lot of, I guess, testing through quite large, um, large numbers of, um, yeah. of predictions and and so forth. What 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 skills would someone need to to have to be able to identify you know a value bet? How, what sort of skills go into um, taking this data that we're talking about to sort of um, you know come up with these expectations of you know probability and what's you know the it's, likely it's, outcome it's, of that. It's a really interesting question, and it's not something I can probably provide an absolute answer on. If, if, if someone could say, what are the skills that I need, mm -hmm. then I guess everyone will be trying to do this, or everyone would be doing this. Um, it's, I know the Sportsbook Pinnacle, they have a, a betting resource article about this subject, and mm -hmm. one of the skill sets they identify is, is if, you, if, if one's an actor, so if you're in the actu actuarial business, accounting business and so it's very much a good skill to have would be someone who's, who's familiar with managing large amounts of data familiarizing with managing risk and understanding risk and statistical variance and also building models and then testing models and so it's, it's very much knowing how to, to, to build a, a model with a set of algorithms testing that and then observing the, the outcomes and and knowing when to judge when you've actually got something that that looks like it's got expected value the the, the, the danger the downside of this is using results to try and test um whether you have found any what's called signal above the, the variance in the noise is it can take a huge amount of time and a huge number of results there are there are shortcuts uh one of the most important ones is what you better know is called the closing line value mm -hmm. so in a, in a standard betting market, if you're bringing information with your money to a betting market that the bookmaker doesn't already have, then it should move the price. So for example, say the bookmaker knows that one of their customers is a professional letter. They may put down $100 or $1,000, or whatever it might be, on a particular thing, particular outcome, and the bookmaker goes, well, Brian, we didn't, we didn't know that, that, that we this, our bet who's going to put so much money on that. The fact that they're doing that means that they must know something that we don't. And so they'll shorten the price. And so by the time the event kicks off, what you would, what you would want to see as a professional better is that the price, in, on average, the prices that you're betting will be lower by the time you get to the closing market, by the time you get to match. And so what's called the closing line value is essentially how much expected value you have got over the bookmaker at the, at the closing price so it might be that um you know it might be that that you'll bet the price of, of in decimal terms it would be um 2.5 in, in uk fractional terms that would be six to four and by the closing it might be 2.0 or mm -hmm. even and the simplest way to measure that value for that bet would be that you just divide 2.5 by 2 which would be 1.25 or your expected value would be 25 percent and if on average after a sample of bets you find that on average you've got the positive percentage there it's a very good indicator that you've got um, what's called closing line value and expected value in your bets and the, the benefit of finding value through this method is that you can do it far more quickly than with results because you're you're stripping out the variance you're just looking at the at the at the signal rather than the noise and it can be done. I think I wrote I wrote an article about this but for the for the bookmaker pinnacle, and it, you can show that it takes as much as a smaller number as fifty bets to actually do this, and it will tell you whether you actually do have 
you're, you're actually bringing information to the bookmaker. There's a, there is some argument about whether it's useful. And I always resolve this argument by saying to people that if you haven't got the closing line value or you don't share it, that doesn't necessarily prove you don't have expected value. <clears throat> But if you do have it, it it's, it's an almost certainty that you have, you're bringing some information to the public, or in some sense, you're, you're placing bets that have information, whether it's you that's bringing the information or someone else is bringing the information and you're just, you're just line chasing or odds chasing. That's neither here nor there. It's the fact that you're, you're betting on things that, that are shortening the market, moving the market. And it's, if you see that, it's a, it's a cast iron, it's virtually a cast iron guarantee that you're a, you're good enough to be a professional better if if you can overcome the other problems of getting your money on the market. Yeah, and I guess uh, you know, I it raises a few things there. I think one of the the things you touched on just in those last bit of comments on that is you know one of the things that that our problem gamblers do engage in is is that sort of chasing the market behavior that you know if a price goes down, therefore someone who is a professional gambler or someone must have known something, so now it's a good time to to run in on that team or that horse or um of course, but, you know they may it doesn't, doesn't necessarily work the other way around does it well they may if as soon as you see the price has moved it's maybe too late the expected value may be gone yeah that's the it's, problem yeah well exactly and i think you know it's interesting what i want to i guess my next question comes to you know you've gone through sort of the process in very open details there without going into too much specific details, I guess, because um, as as we know, professional gamblers are notoriously um, opaque about exactly what it is that they do. Um, but one of the things that you know, uh, you mentioned um, in sort of your opening remarks is that when you looked at becoming a professional gambler yourself, that it was something that, um, you know, you were able to sort of break even, but it wasn't something where you were able to make um, a lot of money from yourself um, mm -hmm. in contrast to to Patrick who you work for who you've described as a, a you know a multi-millionaire um, so given that given you're someone that really understands the general framework of the process understands that it requires modeling it requires data it requires testing um, and it's it's still something that you know you yourself haven't been able to you know, really crack that barrier into professional gambler. I guess the question then asks is, are there many of these people around? Are they are they rare or are they common as people think they are? They're not common, no. It's it's again, it's like asking a, 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 a professional gambler what it is that you do that makes them successful. They're not gonna tell yeah. you. It's, it's another one of those difficult questions to answer. I've spent a bit of time actually trying to analyze it quantitatively and, I've kind of resolved it at a number of around, well, there's two types of bookmakers to, add to, to kind of take this question back a level. Um, mm -hmm. There's what's called the professional smart bookmaker or sharp bookmaker, for example, like Pinnacle Sports, where mm -hmm. they will accept professional winners mm -hmm. without respect. There's then the other type of bookmaker, which you might call the, the recreational bookmaker, or what's commonly known as the soft bookmaker, and they'll give you soft pricing. And it's easier to beat those prices. I, I can beat those prices and I can find expected value against those prices. And I offer for free, I offer a, a system that will do that. Um, the, the downsides of betting at those bookmakers is you're very, very res quickly restricted. And you wouldn't be able to use such a system at a bookmaker like Pinnacle. Mm -hmm. So in answer to the original question, how many people are winning? Or how many, to reframe it slightly, how many people could win? The, the figure is probably somewhere between three and five percent uh -huh. of customers at a soft book or at a recreational book will find themselves restricted in some way. Uh -huh. But that kind of gives you a feel of how many people are potentially good enough to be the recreational bookmaker. Probably one in 20 at, at a maximum. And, and the other uh -huh. 19 just aren't doing the things that would even take them to a place where they could find that expected value. Then you've got the sharp book. I would say that it's probably five to 10 times smaller. So you're probably looking at about 1%, I would say the maximum, um, who are proficient enough to find long-term positive expected value at a bookmaker like Pinnacle. I think, I believe the Betfair Exchange, which is a slightly different model, but again, will not restrict um, winners because you're essentially, the, the Betfair is, the, the Betfair company is just taking the commission and they're allowing punters to play against other punters. Mm. 
they quote a figure of about, I think, 0.5% of their customers pay what's called the premium charge, which is a charge that they impose on betters that are winning more than a certain amount over a certain amount of time. So that, again, gives you a, a, a useful figure, kind of a benchmark figure of how many people may be making some kind of earnings from this. That's not to say that that half a percent of the customers is making a professional living from betting. I, I suspect it's fewer than that, and not uh, uh, some of those will have other jobs and other forms of income. So it's not many. And then, then of course, within that subset, it's a sliding scale. You, you, my, my guess is that, like with most of these natural uh, populations, it will be what's called Pareto distributed. So it'll be a It'll be the, it, it, the what's called the 80 20 rule. So, 20% of professional or 20% of winning customers will be winning 80% of the profits. And then that 80 20 rule is recursive. So, within the, the top 20%, 20% of that 20% will be earning the top 80%. And so, you eventually get down to a point where probably the, the half, of, half of all big earnings, big professional earnings, is earned by just a small number of betters, and of course, you, you know the big big guys like Starlers and, and and those sorts of groups that are earning millions and millions and millions. Uh, they have big teams of ones behind them and, and data analyzers. So it's it's not as I've always I've spent the last ten or fifteen years a lot of my material is to remind folk that it's this is not for the faint-hearted. It's this is not a job that you can think. It, it's an easy way to make a living. It's not, and any professional better will tell you it's not an easy way to make a living. It takes a lot of time and a lot of effort that goes into it. So, I guess the the, the enjoyment for potential professional better, or one who's who's embarking on such a career or, or hoping to reach it, is it's the it's the thrill of can I actually do this? Can I make this off my own back and actually beat the system and win with what's called bits? I guess is how I termed it in. In one of my books, and I guess that's that's the thrill, being able to do it. It's not about the, not for me. It wouldn't necessarily be about the money, and it wouldn't necessarily be about winning. It would be about the, the finding the value and beating the system. Yeah. So it definitely yeah, sounds yeah. So it definitely sounds like this sort of fantasy, so to speak, that a lot of our our get problem gamblers have this idea that they can use this sort of passion they have for sports to all of a sudden um you know win some money betting and then find themselves on easy street it's just it's not a it's not a realistic proposition it's not no no but what i would say is that i mean certainly for me um and of course i've been financially rewarded in a different way from, from mm -hmm. the industry but um i would say that the so long as it doesn't become dangerous and pathological the process that one might embark upon um through learning a lot of these these ideas through through gambling is actually really beneficial for life more generally so learning to appreciate that actually it's not just about your outcomes and it's not necessarily about because life is so it's just so full of variance it's so so much of what happens in life is about luck and it's going through the process of, of trying to become a professional gambler, or at least just trying to find expected value. And all of the techniques you learn, and the journey you go on, it kind of gives you an appreciation for the variance and, of life and the, and the chance that, that is, exists in life. And I, I found it, it's made me a lot more humble about the things that I experience. And I, it, I can reflect on, say, certain things that might happen to me. And I think, how much of that did I actually have anything to do with? And how much of it was just, was just chance? And so, it's it's going on the journey of understanding the process of what's involved to becoming a professional veteran has for me been the most rewarding thing even though i haven't necessarily become a professional veteran i would say to anyone who embarks on such a journey but isn't successful i would say don't judge it by the fact that you may not have made any money from it judge it by the fact that you've gone on a on a, on a learning experience and for me that would be a, a really it would be one of the key ways I would try, or some of the key ideas I would try and introduce to some uh, any gambling um, clinics that are trying to help people steer away from pathological gambling. I would try and help them focus on the enjoyment of the process rather than the insistence of making money and and winning and and so on. Yeah. 
that's I think for me that would be the most useful thing. Yeah, and it's definitely a useful, and it's just one of these things that, and it, it requires, I guess, for a lot of people, a complete reimagining of what they're doing with betting to make that shift, make that shift away from the outcome to to as you put exactly. it, expectation. And and I think it's all, uh, you know, I just find it, I was finding it fascinating listening to you. It's sort of, it's almost like, uh, you know, really, I guess, you know, we think about maths um, as this sort of. Um, you know, just numbers on a page, so to speak, but it really brings home this idea that mathematics is really behind, you know, it's the language of the universe, so to speak, and mm. sort of being able to sort of, um, you know, think about probability, think about, um, you know, uh, you but, know, making, exactly our decision it. making, it's, it's, yeah, it's sort of, it's, it's, le it's, it's learned, I think the, the great thing about gambling is that it, it encourages and teaches people to think what I call probabilistically mm -hmm. rather than deterministically. So you, you we're so human beings are so much orientated towards cause and effect and, and particularly agency in cause and effect. Something must have caused or made A create B. And there's usually some person that, that is behind that. I mean, to get religious for a minute, it's the, the whole concept of God, isn't it? God is, mm -hmm. is, an, is an agent. Um, and yet deterministic thinking in complex world is not always the right way, the, the, the best way to think because in complex systems, trying to unpick how we got from A to B is sometimes so, so difficult that thinking in, ter in deterministic sense is, is not actually the most useful. If we think more probabilistically and we actually understand the business of luck and variance, I think it's much more useful and, and it, it, it's for me it's been the most rewarding part of this journey is not actually ending up beating the system or not even making any profit from this but just essentially becoming a different person and actually becoming more humble about about the vagaries of life it's yeah. and it's really for me that's the that's that would be that's the best aspect to gamble is that it, it can teach people a different way of thinking Oh well, yeah, I don't know. One of one of the things, not just in gambling, but one of the things in psychology in general that we find that um, is a good predictor of someone's well-being is their ability to sit with uncertainty. And exactly. yeah. <laughs> I think that's a big part of what you're getting at there. So it's, you know, the, the irony is, is that one of the reasons we we like to gamble is because we like to feel in control. And in, in the sense of gambling, it's about predicting the future, and feeling in control of one's destiny. So that's kind of the irony, the paradox, is that in actual fact, once you, once you immerse yourself in the process, you, you come to understand that really it's about becoming more accepting of uncertainty. So that, and that for me, I found very, very paradoxical and yet very exciting at the same time. It's this, this, this feeling that we need to be in control of our destiny and yet actually it's becoming more comfortable with uncertainty that's the key to to a, a, i guess a, a more comfortable existence a comfortable way of life i think and so much i think i think so much many pro problems in society is to do with just feeling out wanting to be in control and feeling out of control and yet i guess maybe the, the way i'm trying to get people to think about gambling is turning it on its head actually become more comfortable with being out of control and you'll regain some control it's mm -hmm. kind of just flipping it over yeah, just sort of accepting there's limits to what we can control and what, exactly. you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, all right. I, I just wanted to circle back a little bit as well, because one of the things that you sort of said is as a good indicator for uh, someone that's, you know, trying to be a professional gambler is if they're, you know, on the right path and they're, they're sort of doing well is this idea of the discrepancy between, you know, when they're betting and sort of the closing line. And, um, I guess the reason, one of the reasons I wanted to come back to it comes to another question that I wanted to ask you today, which is in terms of are there differences in different types of betting markets that a professional gambler might approach? And the reason I want to ask that is because um, like in Australia, for example, on horse racing, most of the betting is still done on a tote system. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, does would betting on a tote system make it easier, more or more difficult for a professional gambler? Does it not make a difference? What does that sort of throwing in that variable of, you know, the fluctuating prices, uh, the fluctuating returns, um, what does that add to the mix? Does that make it more difficult to 
to get that sort of um, advantage and that value on a on a tote based system. I, I mean, I don't. I'm not super familiar with tote betting just because I've never really done it. So, but I think it's it's just horses for courses. It's what it's what your skill set is most suited for. I mm -hmm. I, mean, I guess really the the main the main difference with regard what uh, or significant feature of what the different hunters or different professional betters will target will be the, the odds. So whether it's totes or whether it's um, just standard fixed odds markets, um, it will be whether they're comfortable betting at long odds or whether they prefer to be betting on short odds. Obviously with, with racing, it tends to be a much more high variance market. You've got many more runners, so the odds tend to be much higher. So your outcomes are potentially much more governed by variance at the at longer odds. You know, the average, I think Patrick Veach, his average odds was something like five, six, seven to one, something like that was his average winner. Whereas someone, a, a better who's more interested in soccer, their average odds might just be uh, evens or, or even shorter than that. If it's Asian handicap, it'd be a bit shorter than even, would be average. And then there'll be other betters who, who may just prefer to target the, the favourites. So it's easy in, in, in the markets like tennis, there's many, many more favourites because it's just two players and often the one player is far better than the other one. And there'll be some professional betters that will just think, I prefer just the short odds range. I, I once had a betting system that I used to market, which just, just focused on prices that were shorter than five to uh, what was it four to one on so 1.25 mm -hmm. and you you sound well people may say well you're not going to make much profit from that well no you of course the profits are smaller because the most you can make from one dollar bet is 25 cents um the point about shorter odds betting is that it reduces the variance so in terms of money management and and your bankroll uh, evolution it's you you get answers to your your questions about whether you've got any skill more quickly in terms of just looking at the results because you've reduced the variance so i guess that it's but again it's to ask the question which are more suitable it it kind of doesn't really matter it's it's what it's what's suited to your skill set so whether it's longer odds or shorter odds it's you it's a, it's a risk reward trade-off if you bet long odds you get more you're going for more reward but the, the, the downside is you've got more you've got to accept more bad good and bad luck swings more variance um the, the, with shorter odds the downside is you get less profit but you stripped out the variance so it's it's like it's like anything in gambling you, there's no free lunch so if you want to if you want to go for one thing you have to give it up in some other area and mm -hmm. it's really if if i was to, if i was giving a, a tutorial to aspiring professional betters and they were saying to me what what, what should, which market should we target i would say Target the ones that you're most comfortable with, that you enjoy the most, that you think you're going to that you're going to know the most about, or be able to get access to the most amount of data. And don't worry too much about the odds, or whether it's totalizer, or whether it's fixed odds, or whether it's whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Focus on what you're good at. Yeah. So it sounds like I guess to sort of um, you know paraphrase what you're saying there, it's like it's not that there's one market that's you know the best one for going for. They all have their advantages and disadvantages, and it really to it's depending on both, you know, what you're bringing yeah. to the table as a gambler, as well as, you know, what, um, I guess, what level of, as you put it, like variability or risk you wanted to sit with, or, you know, there's yeah. a whole yeah. host of, it's not that there's, you know, a neat answer, yes, tennis is the way to make a fortune. Yeah, it's, no. Um, I mean, again, also, another trade-off you have to have as a professional is that you, you might think, well, I, I'm really good at this particular niche market. So, for example, you might be good at ski jump. Market. Um, and there are very, very few people that are doing that, and maybe the bookmaker doesn't have as much information available to them. So you think, well, okay, I, I'm much more likely to be good in that market because I'm competing against far fewer people. The trade-off with that is that the bookmaker will allow you to have such big stakes because they have to manage the liability, so they've got less information. There's less overall volume coming into that market, so they can't be allowing such big, big stakes as they say might on the Super Bowl or the the FA Cup final or what have you. So again, that's another trade-off. You might think, well, do I am I happy to take some very niche information into a niche market and have a better chance of getting higher expected value, but 
I'm allowed only smaller stakes, or do I take the chance of going into a much bigger market like Premiership football or Champions League football, where I'm betting against potentially much bigger fish and it might be harder to win, harder to find the expected value, but I've got a better chance of having bigger stakes and making a bigger overall profit. Again, the trade-offs are, there's no right or wrong answer. It's, I would mm -hmm. say just what, what works best for you is, is the answer. So. Okay, yeah, it's it's definitely it's sort of it's almost like um, yeah, like finding the right job or sort of matchmaking. There's no different yeah, things yeah. are going to work for different people. Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So all right, I just wanted to um, before we finish up, there's just a couple of questions I wanted to ask you, and these sort of go around, you know, some of the narratives and some of the um, um, the common myths that we get around gambling that you know we often see with the the problem, the clients that are wanting help with uh, gambling problems that we see. And, and one thing that comes out a lot is that, you know, when something uh, unexpected happens, that, you know, the narrative is, oh, you know, the bookmakers, you know, must have taken a hit with that one or things like that. Are the bookmakers often out uh, on single events? And, you know, there's this idea of bookmakers taking a hit on things when something that's you know got quite a big price on it gets up is that does that happen very often that they're sort of out of pocket a lot yeah without a doubt bookmakers are risk managers and there's there's kind of a, a myth that goes around that the bookmakers will seek to balance action on both sides so that no matter what the result they'll be taking a profit now yes that's their aspiration the trouble is it's very very difficult to, for them to make to manage that on a on a market by market basis they play what's you know the the, the game of large numbers so that over hundreds of markets and thousands of markets yes they will have balanced action but on a on a single market absolutely not i mean the obvious the, the obvious one would be say the amount of money they take on on draws in 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 professional football is is far smaller than what the odds suggest they should be. So if, if you were to price just simply according to the amount of money that was coming into your market, the draw option wouldn't be priced at two or three to one. It would be more like five or six to one. But of course, as soon if they were to move it to that price to try and balance the money, immediately the professional betters who know a bit more about than the other 19 out of 20, they'll just pile on and, and take all that, that money. So it would be impossible. So so yes, because of because of biases in the way that that punters bet, it forces the bookmakers to 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 have um, inefficient odds on a market by market basis. So absolutely, good and bad luck will will influence very much their their turnover on a bet by bet basis. So yes, it's absolutely true to say that they will take big hits now and again, depending on the results. But they very much understand that. And they very much manage it on the with the law, law, law of large numbers, and they also make it they work it to their favour as well. So when there's a big payout on a particular event, they'll use that in some sort of marketing strategy, saying that mm -hmm. so and so made two million. This was the, the biggest payout we had this year, and of course it just attracts more punters to thinking, well, if they've done it, then I can do that as well. So yeah. they'll the bookmakers very much use that as a marketing strategy. So so definitely yeah, when they've when they've had that big winner, it's really about just. I guess, you know, and you see this in the paper all the time, you know, someone got so-and-so on the trifecta, you know, um, you know, $10,000 on a trifecta on the Melbourne Cup and, you know, they put, you know, $200 on it and now, you know, blah, and so on and so forth, just as sort of as a way of sort of saying, yeah, here's the, you know, here's the way you can make money on this and it's going to be great and you're going to be happy and it's all going to be fun. Yeah, but of course it isn't for nearly everyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, and the other one I wanted to ask you, because this is also one that comes up a lot with our, our clients um, that are wanting help with gambling problems, is a lot of them are using um, uh, sort of accumulators, what we call multi-bets um, mm. in, in Australia, where they have, you know, five, six, seven, sometimes more legs um, as a way of sort of, you know, gamblers conceptual, uh, many of the gamblers we see conceptualize this as a way of um, having a small outlay and turning it into a relatively large profit from a you know a value perspective are accumulators a good way of betting no it's a disaster absolute disaster if unless of course you have expected value in every part of your accumulator mm -hmm. and then it's it's like compound interest so 
to work out your expected value for an accumulator, you simply multiply the expected values for each bit. So say you have a, a treble and each part of that treble has positive expected value of 10%, so 1.1. So to work it out for the full treble, it's 1.1 to the power of 3, so 1.1 times 1.1 times 1.1, which would be at something like 1.33, so 33%. So you've now inflated your expected value from 10% to 33%. Of course, there's a smaller chance of it happening because, say, the odds for each part were 2, it would be 2 times 2 times 2, which would be 8. So there's, there's now a, only a 1 in 8 chance that the bet will win, but the expected value is 33% instead of 10%. And of course, professional bunters are more, more interested in the expected value. Um, the flip side is, of course, it works the other way. If you don't have the expected value, say each single is minus 10%, you end up with minus 33%. Now, nearly every better is going to be minus. Now, as I've said, 19 out of 20 on a, at a recreation bookmaker and one you know, 99 out of 100 at, at a sharp bookmaker will, will have negative expected value. So, Betting accumulators is, is the fast route to ruin. And even for professional bettors, they, they will tend not to bother with accumulators unless there's some um, reason to do with their money management strategy that, 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 that makes it beneficial to them. Um, they will prefer singles simply just to reduce the, the variance. Just to, to, to they, they don't, they tend not to prefer really, really long odds. And of course you get, the, the bigger the accumulator, the longer the odds. And they're not really interested in that sort of betting. They're more interested in managing the variance. So, uh, but but if they were, it, you still have the same problem that it would only take. Say you you had a, a, like a five way accumulator, you would only take maybe two bad bits of that to turn it into a negative. So you might you might have found the value on three parts of it. So you might have ten percent value on three of it, but then you did a really bad job on the other two, and immediately you've turned three potentially winning things into into overall you've turned it into a, a losing bet. In terms of expectation so they they are the worst possible thing you can bet on really as accumulators but of course they are the most fascinating to the the average punter simply because it's small outlay for a potentially big win and of course human beings massively overestimate the chances of small probability events it's all written up in Parliament's book on thinking fast and slow about how we, we massively misjudge probability events um, but humans are brilliant at that. So they might think that a, a one in a hundred to one shot, oh, well, well actually it's going to be more like, I don't know, a 5% or a 10% chance. But of course it isn't. In fact, with the, the margin built in through, essentially, you, you, essentially what you're doing is you're increasing the margin by having more and more parts to that accumulator. And it's, it's madness. If I was to give lessons to any any, I'd say, right, let's num lesson number one, we're not going to bet accumulators. We're only going to bet singles for this reason. Once you prove yourself to be good enough to be a professional, you can then start thinking about doubling up or trebling up. But until you've done that, forget it. But of course, telling someone that is like, yeah, no, I know, but it's like just a small amount of money and I could win big. Well, okay, go and play the lottery. That's yeah. what I'd say. Fair. All right. And I think. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a good place to end on because it's, it's probably, you know, a very clear answer to that question. Is this a good idea? No, it is not. So, so I think that's, um, you know, definitely for me on a personal level, something to take with me, but also I think um, on the whole, I, I'd like to thank you for, um, yeah, for talking to me today, because I think we've got, um, hopefully you found it interesting too, but I think we've definitely, you know, answered quite a lot of questions as to, you know, what goes on in, in you know betting markets what what does it take to become a professional gambler and and even if you know you haven't necessarily given us the answers to do it ourselves i think you've definitely given us a lot to think about and really reconceptualize this this whole endeavor as something so completely different from what the greater majority of people who are betting are are, are doing mm, yeah yeah well thanks for having me so <laughs> all right well no thank you so much and um yeah, I'll, um, let me just pause recording. All right, so um, thank you for everyone watching through that. So um, yeah, I, first of all, I'd like to say that it wasn't planned that I was wearing the same shirt today <laughs> as what I did in the interview. That was entirely unintentional. I will reassure you all that I do have multiple shirts of all varying colors. Um, but I'd like to start just, yeah, with my reflection. And I think, 
for me, first of all, uh, the most striking thing from that interview was here is um, here is a guy who has spent decades looking into betting markets, who has access to vast amounts of data that he is able to charge other people for. So it's obviously useful data. And even with, and he understands the, the process of what someone has to do to be a professional gambler. And yet, and yet he was very clear at the start that he is not a professional gambler and he has not been able to do this himself. I thought that was quite striking. Um, and it really goes to show that even if you understand the general principles behind um, what it takes to be a value better, that it is actually a really difficult thing to do. Um, and to me, that was quite striking. I don't know. What were your thoughts on that, Dylan? No, Chris, I had a very similar thought. Um, I think um, before I watched this video, I had a misconception myself that um, professional bettors, yes, they had to be highly skilled. They had to be very smart and have this statistical knowledge. But um, listening to the interview, it really pointed out that it's not just that. It's also a lot of hard work. <clears throat> and it's, a, it's also quite costly in terms of buying the data as well. So, um, and, and even just the, the, the point that Joseph made in terms of it's a sliding scale. So I think we, we think that these professional bettors are, are all millionaires, but not necessarily. Um, they, they could put a lot of work into this and, and, and break even, but it, it may be better off for them just to, just to keep their day job um, in essence. Yeah, definitely. And I think I was also... Um, I his his sort of estimate of of how many professional gamblers out there definitely was to me sounded a little bit inflated from numbers that I've heard in different quarters before. And I think part of the explanation for that is he did make a distinction between two different types of bookmakers. So the sort of the bookmakers that are going for the general market and the bookmakers that are aiming um for more of that um. I guess, professional slash hardcore sort of gamblers. And um, I guess most of the clients we're dealing with would be betting with the former type of bookmakers that are sort of the mass market ones. And these more boutique ones, um, even though they target these sort of gamblers, he he said that himself that it's only 1% of them. Um, but, you know, the numbers that I've heard from people at the tab and other organizations is it's something a more like one in 10,000 as opposed to one in a one in a hundred. So I don't know, it's... Yeah, it's and even the numbers of those that are actually making a, an amount you could live off, it seems it's it's quite small numbers that we're talking about. Yeah, I, I think um, it's safe to say it's very small numbers, but the exact number um, is still a little bit up for debate. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so if you guys have any questions or comments, please send them through to us. So I did get a comment um, from Chris Davidson at Wesley, and he sort of he sort of noticed, and I sort of was struck by this too, is when he's sort of talking about one thing that sort of looking at betting markets from his point of view, one thing that it forces him to do is to focus on, as I was talking about earlier today, this sort of um, probabilistic view of the universe um, and accepting that there's things that we can't control. And it was almost um, sort of quasi-spiritual the way he was sort of describing it. And and um, Chris sort of made, Chris Davidson made the comment that it's, yeah, that sort of learning from the, pro, uh, learning from the process, experiencing things, it's a direct contrast from what we hear from our clients where, you know, people that have problems with gambling, experiencing harm with gambling, they're very much focused on the short term, getting the results now and nothing else. And it sort of is a, a vast contrast from what he's describing in terms of that focus on the process rather than the results. And yeah, it, it had almost like a quasi spiritual feel to it when the way he was describing. I don't know. What were your thoughts on that one? Um, no, I, I thought so too. And I, I thought I, I actually got something out of that myself in terms of, um, you know, that with the, the, the vague vagueness of um, life sometimes to kind of, we do need to give up a little bit of control. And I think you mentioned, Chris, to, to, to be comfortable with uncertainty at times. So there's certainly a life lesson um, within that. I actually had a question for you, um, if that's all right. There was so much information that came through that interview. I was interested to know how you might potentially use that um, when treating people with a gambling problem? Yeah, look, I think I think in some ways the main take home, I guess, for someone with a with a gambling uh, that's experiencing gambling harm that comes into our clinic, I think the main thing is to try and get them to shift that perspective that, you know, that this this is a task, this is a system that's essentially set up with the assumption that the vast majority of people 
who are participating in it are going to lose far more than they're winning. And the sort of information that we got from that goes into a lot of detail about, well, if you want to make a change to that, if you want to be one of that tiny minority that isn't losing more than you win, what have you got to do? And that, you know, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to say that I was able to sort of pick everything that he said from that and to me, it's like, well, now I've got it very clear in my head what I need to do, because as he himself said, the actual professional gamblers are quite vague about the actual process that they go through. But understanding the sheer amount of data that you have to, not just the amount of data, but the cost of the data, the modeling that's required, the understanding of probability, the understanding of um, even just having that mindset of a probabilistic uh, worldview, what really needs to go into well, if you want to beat the markets, this is what you've got to do. And really just showing to clients, this is what you're competing against. This is what you have to do if you mm. want to beat it. And just showing, well, look, this is so out of reach to, to the vast majority of the population. It isn't that, and that's the message that you'd want to give to, the, to a client. It's not that you're doing something wrong per se. It's that this system is set up in such a way that unless you have that skill, unless you have that time, unless you have that that access to data, you're not going to win. You're not going to get there. You're not going to, you're always going to lose more than you win. And it's just about highlighting that there's, there's no way to beat that unless you do it this particular way, mm. which for most people is out of reach. Yeah, I think that point was made early on where um, that the betters just massively owes, overestimate the level of skill um, that they're bringing to the mm -hmm. table. And I think maybe a key takeaway from this interview is really not, not getting an understanding of, of how to be a professional better, but essentially getting insight and an understanding of what we don't know when it, uh, when it relates to, to professional betting, like what, what we really just can't necessarily achieve. Um, and that, that would be an interesting uh, or important point to highlight to people um, with oh, that overestimation, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And if anyone else has any questions or comments, please send them through. Um, but the thing is, even despite the fact that he hedged his answers on a lot of questions, he did give one very definitive answer, which is multi-bets are, I think the word he used, are a disaster. So multi-bets are a terrible idea, they're the worst possible thing. But I think there's something that, not just in our clients, but in, in uh, casual and social gamblers, they're, they're a really common and popular way of betting. And I think it was really highlighting that actually, you know, this is a way of losing your money faster rather than a way of recouping your losses quickly, which is how a lot of our, our clients see these sort of bets. I don't know. I, you, are you someone that's ever put on multi bets yourself, Dylan? Or I, I I have, um, so I am guilty of that. But I, I think I've got a fair um, fair understanding of of how likely it is is to get up. So the way that I've kind of understand multis is that the bookie with a single bet will, will build their edge into a into a single bet of, of what they expect to get back, and and with each leg of a multi, that their essentially their edge just gets compounded compounded again and again. So it just increases, therefore decreasing my likelihood of winning, but not to say that out of interest, I haven't um, put one on. Yeah. And it's just interesting. So I just got a comment from uh, one of my colleagues here at Sydney Uni, Adrian Yenna, who, who just highlighted that actually, you know, bookmakers are often offering deals and promotions on multi-bets to sort of encourage people to take up this sort of bet. And I think, you know, this interview today really highlights maybe why bookmakers might want to funnel people into this style of bets, given that they are, um, you know, as as Joseph said, the worst possible thing if you're trying to bet in a in a sensible way. Um, look, we just have another comment or question from from Claire Thomas. So she asked, um, "I wonder how many people presenting for counselling are picturing themselves as having the potential to be professional betters." Um, look, how I'd answer that question is there definitely is um, for those who are betting on horses and sports. There definitely is a a big chunk of clients who are saying that they they would like they're aiming to be a professional gambler they want to get better at it or that perhaps even that's how they started on the journey they started on the journey thinking they had a few wins early on they thought you know they hear stories about professional gamblers they think well maybe this is the path that I can be on and so they start on that path um, although by the time they see us you know perhaps when the losses have accumulated they've sort of moved away from that but they still feel a need to try and uh, to try and win some of that money back. But I think the wider point is a lot of our clients who who bet on horses and sports, 
they because they do know professional gamblers exist they they do believe that it's possible for them to win more than they lose whether or not they go down the professional path and because they have that belief that it's possible to win more than they lose that's part of what keeps them going it's part of what um, factors into well if i'm losing more than i win what i need to do is tinker what i'm focusing on so for a, a racing client for example if i'm focusing on um, the last three starts and that's not working for me then I need to focus instead on on who the jockey is or I need to focus on who the trainer is or I need to focus on the weather conditions so because there is that knowledge that professional gamblers exist it might not encourage people to try to aim for that in and of themselves but it does encourage people to persist with gambling because they believe it is possible for them to win more than they're losing so all right um did you have any other thoughts Dylan um, no, not not at this particular time. Um, I, I think it's, it's a lot of information to digest, and I think um, people in the audience are probably currently trying to um, digest it. But. Yeah, and I think so. And I think you know, perhaps if people have questions uh, later on that that come up later on, always feel free to email me, um, and you know, we'll do the best we can to answer them. As you know, if you ask me a question about, well, how do I make money off gambling? I'm not going to be able to answer that question myself, but because I don't know any more than, than what we discussed in in the interview today. Um, so I just have um, uh, a question from uh, Clive Orcock. So betting odds are affected by takeout, but in Australia, that's about 15% on the tote versus 8% on fixed odds. So the latter is clearly the best at most times. Um, exotics, so that tends to be, um, um, you know, focusing on like those sort of more micro events. The takeout can be much, oh, or on these sort of um, things like trifectas and things like that. The takeout can be as large as 20%. Um, and he's also made the comment that an inquiry to the House of Lords uh, in, in the UK, where a CEO from a betting company noted that over 99% of people lose. So, so I think that's also worth noting that there is the vast majority of people who are betting are going to be losing. So, and I think that's the other take home that even with his estimates, which um, are slightly inflated from the estimates that I've heard, um, still suggest that the vast majority of people here are losing. Um, and what it would take to win would be so very different from, um, from what our, our clients are trying to do that really focused. And I think that, you know, coming back to that, as I said, that almost quasi-spiritual um, sort of comments on deterministic versus probabilistic um, worldview. And I guess this this comes to also the comment that we got from uh, from Chris Davidson about, um, uh, you know, the clients that we see focus on that immediate result and what's happening next. It really comes back to one of the things that, um, so Fadi Anjul, who developed the treatment that we hear, use at Sydney University, really makes this distinction between the big picture and the small picture. And I think that really is part of what's going on here, is that the clients we see are very much focused on the small picture. What is possible today? Can I be up today? Am I going to walk away a winner today? And what Joseph was really talking about today is sort of what Fadi refers to as the big picture, like taking that step back and really seeing what's going on overall. What is the what is the numbers saying about where I'm going with this journey? I agree with that, Chris. And I, I did have a, a thought when Joseph, Joseph mentioned that the professional better can take the emotional side out of the bets that they're making and just purely go by the numbers. But I, I had some hesitancy even around that. And I was wondering if professional betters, like they're betting such large numbers on a particular event, surely their, their emotions still going to be triggered when, when they see a loss of a large of a large number and what that actually does to their their confidence in their betting strategy at that particular time. Well, indeed, I guess, you know, you have to be fairly certain in what you're doing to sort of be able to write out those that that sort of hits from from taking big losses from time to time. Um, I just got another comment again from Chris Davidson at Wesley saying there's always a danger in asking clients about the details of particular bets as it can actually trigger the urge to gamble. And I think this might have to be a point where I might have to agree to disagree on that, because I think it's really crucial that when we're talking to clients, whether it's about wagering or about uh, any form of gambling, or indeed any behaviour that we're talking about, that as counsellors, psychologists, social workers, treating professionals, uh, in order to enact a change in any behaviour, we really have to understand the details of the behaviour that the client's engaging in, 
and what's going through their mind at that particular moment. So I actually think it is crucial to understand the thought processes that are going through someone's mind before they're putting a bet on, um, because I think that's going to be really illuminating and really help find pathways to uh, to work on those particular thoughts and make changes to them. So um, I think, yes, there is a risk in the, in the short term that talking about betting might prompt someone to think about it, but I think you can't change a behavior without really examining the process that's going through their mind um, that's going on. And um, yes, and I just got a comment from Alona Santa, um, who works at Catholic Care, and she said, well, if clients are triggered, it's our job as clinicians to help settle them before they leave the session. And I think that's a good point as well. I think while it is important to be mindful of things that might uh, trigger or prompt our clients, um, whether it's prompting certain emotions or prompting engaging in certain behaviors, it is our, you know, we shouldn't shy away from those things purely for fear of, of prompting or triggering something because um, in doing so, we're doing our clients a disfavor, a disservice from, from not examining the thought processes that lead them to engage in a behavior. But I think Alona is right that, you know, it really, the onus is on us to sit with a client and help them um, digest any material before they move on. Um, all right, so any other comments or questions before we finish up? Um, so if we don't have any other questions or comments, I might leave by just reminding everyone that if you do wanna watch this again, because as, as we sort of went through, there was a lot of detail in today's, um, in today's journal club, the, the recording of this will be online within a couple of days and I will email everyone when that is online. Um, just another reminder, firstly, for any journal club ideas for next year, if you see any good speakers at conferences, at events that you think would be a good speaker for journal club, please let me know. We're in the process of planning our schedule for next year and we're hoping to have that out um, sort of either December or January, our schedule for next year. And just a reminder again, so starting on 1st of December, another webinar series, the Technology and Technology Research and Gambling Group here at Sydney University, uh, which is headed by Professor Sally Gainsbury, is going to be restarting their, um, their webinar series. And I'm, it's going to be weekly webinars, and I will send out all the details to the Journal Club email list for those webinar series as well. All right. Um, did you have any concluding remarks before we finish, Dylan? No, it was um, just thank you very much for having me on today. It was a um, fascinating um, journal club. So um, really interesting one to think about and to, to talk about. So I hope everyone um, got as much out of it as I did. Yeah, so and thank you for, for um, oh, um, yeah. So thank you for all, all your comments. If you have any other questions, please, uh, please email me or any comments. Um, just as another, so myself and my colleague, Adrian, we're going to be sending out uh, an evaluation form that's going to be covering Journal Club for the year. So um, we'd really appreciate it if you all fill that out to give us feedback um, so that we can present it to our funding body, the feedback that we receive on Journal Clubs, and also just to help us make it a better experience for everyone. So please fill those out. Thank you again, and look forward to seeing you all in the new year. All of us. Thanks.